Thank you everyone for being here on a Friday, very, very late, on a Friday on KubeCon. Uh, so my name is William Caban and this is uh, Federico Rossi. We are some telco guys working at Red Hat. So why does two telco guys are working on sustainability? Well, it happened that the telco itself, the telco industry, represent about 2% of the total humanity consumption of energy. So yes, we should be doing something. And this is part of uh, an integration uh, work that we created. And what's in the name is the following. So smart, because we want to make sure that we can do far more than just the traditional automations. We want to be able to use machine learning models and apply uh, AI to achieve certain goals. In this particular case, we are talking about the goal of green computing and following cloud native principles. And it should work for experimentation and the same side should work for operations. So that's, that's really what this means. Now, some concept here, goal-driven workload management. Let's start with that. And the idea here is that we don't want just to go and have another specialized orchestrator. We, we want to be able to define goals. Today, we're talking about, for example, the goal of, okay, let's, let's do certain amount, a maximum certain amount of CO2 uh, on cluster or per node in material of the source that that particular node or cluster can be uh, being powered by. So, you see there, for example, on carbon, petroleum, and the others, each one of them has certain penalty on, on the CO2 emission. But when we talk about a goal-driven, basically, orchestration, so for example, in the traditional way here, everything will pretty much be spread across, and our CO2 will be uh, off. Now, if I set up a goal, when I go back to the goal-driven workload management, when we set up a goal, what's going to happen is that it will really focus on achieving that even when there are compute resources available. So if, let's say in this case, the, the future workload cannot, for example, that has uh, five units of penalty, and there's no way, even when there's compute, there's no way to put that there or, or make it run without uh, breaking the, the goal, okay? So that, that's part of the, the idea behind the goal-driven workload. And the same apply to any other goal, which could be like, okay, I want to run this on more power-efficient nodes, or run this to reduce my energy consumption, or to have higher availability or lower latency to our customers. So that's the idea here. And it applies the same for node or clusters. Uh, another concept is the idea of domain-aware workload management. And these two needs to be together because not all the workloads can be treated the same. So understanding the goal, we can also map that to the realities of that type of workload. And again, being from telco world, that means we can relate to, for example, what happened that, let's say, during KubeCon is a, it's a big conference, from what we can see here during any other time of every night, uh, there would not be too much activity. So basically, you can really uh, dim down or basically remove workload that will help, for example, on the caching or things like that on the telco side. Now, once it starts detecting that there's people coming, then it can go and uh, increase those. So all of that knowledge on how to do it is very specific to that domain. The same thing will apply to training or other uh, specialized workload. So with that, so okay, let's make sure that we can do an integration that is composable, that it works for experimentation and uh, the operations team. These are problems that have been solved already. So we start very basic with adopting the GitOps model, because that gives us uh, basically a declarative way and a version way of rebuilding anything. So that means that if my infrastructure here or platform 
uh, highlight there by letter E, is destroyed, I still have a way to recover that and redo exactly to the point uh, right before it was destroyed without having to worry about other mechanism or traditional way of doing this. The other part of this is each one of these blocks here can scale independently. So even when they have a certain relationship, each one can scale as needed by our organization. So that means I can do this from a centralized location or I can have this highly distributed. Again, it's based on the, what the organization will need. The same will happen, for example, in F, where we are collecting all the metrics and logs. Yeah, on certain organizations, we can centralize those. On central, certain metrics, we can do that as well. But for example, again, on our wall of the telco world, we have situations where just a single device, for example, an antenna, can be generating around 10 gigabits per second of metrics. Imagine now having 100 of those in a small city like this, how much bandwidth you will need to have if you want to move that outside the area. So that's why it needs to be able to have those blocks in a way that can be scaled and distributed when, whenever needed. The other part of this is that, okay, so we have the metrics that we can gather from infrastructure, we can gather from the platform and the application. But if we want to do, in this case, the goal of, okay, the CO2 emissions, something that happened with the CO2 emissions is that during the day, they will vary from your power uh, provider. So during the day, if they're using renewable energies, they, they can be using more solar, or if they have wind, wind, but there will be, that, that will be changing every single day of the week and every single time. So that means we need to bring those as additional metadata and metrics to enhance those, uh, those values and other metrics that we already have in, in the system. So that's where uh, the calculated or derived, derived one <laughs> will come in. Um, that's another notion, for example, outside the, the, there's equipment, there's switches and routers. So we also want to account for their consumption power consumption and how that impacts, for example, when we communicate two services in the same location. So when account for that as part of the CO2 emissions that that worker is generating or that service. From there, we have to evolve into, okay, so GitHub is great, you have a declarative mode, but at scale, maintaining those declarations, it will be uh, quite painful. Uh, Think of the declaration of all these YAML files. So we need an easier way for, let's say, executives or the business uh, owner to declare what they really want. And that's where the intent-driven uh, identification of those constraints come into the table. Now, there's everything else, we know how to do it. That part, for now, we're gonna integrate it here. When we bring the actual, uh, basically all the MLOps uh, uh, area or, or stack in this case, that also have the, the governance and the, the ability to do experimentation with actual data. But remember, since we have to design this in a way that it works for centralized or highly distributed environment, that means that part is also uh, something that can go centralized or can be highly distributed. So that, for example, if, if I go back to, to my previous example of when everyone is here in KubeCon, so those models, if I want to really be accurate, I have to run those models in this area. I cannot try to centralize that because it's just too much data to move. And by the time I'm finishing moving it, it's useless because it's a time-bound uh, value uh, metrics. So, um, in this case, the intent-driven constraint basically will work at that layer. And now we have basically a goal-driven uh, versioning uh, system that we can do all these operations. So, at the end, that's the, the full stack. Now, there are some initial use cases that we were 
uh, looking to, to tackle with this, uh, there's, there are some that are completely on the telco side, but some that are applicable to everyone, for example, here. The maximum CO2 emission per node or per cluster that everyone can relate to. So that's the one that we're going to be talking today. Uh, and Federico will be doing that part. But let me, for example, explain the others. You see that auto tiering of services. So a challenge that it will happen to any organization doing user facing type of uh, services at scale which can be streaming service, it can be any of those, is that when we start and we have very few subscribers, for example, it makes a ton of sense to have that on a public cloud. Now, if you're doing a streaming service and you start having a lot of subscribers, just the egress cost will affect your financial models. So that's when you want only under those circumstances to bring that on premise. And now think, Having that stack where we can correlate and identify all these patterns. So now that I identify the patterns on, okay, based on the financial model, this time I can maintain my, my, my revenue uh, or, or the profit per se, then I can do this uh, auto tiering of the services and, and bring services as needed and, and bring them back out again based on what it makes sense at that moment for the financial model. Uh, the last one I want to highlight here is this smart maintenance. And what happened is that up to now, uh, a lot of the industry still consider, okay, we'll have maintenance windows. And it might work on, on a lot of the industry, or commercial industry, but that's not working, for example, for the world that I have to work with, which is the telco. Um, our, our regular deployment, for example, 5G antennas, that can range from 50,000 to 100,000 of those, each one will have one to 10 or more service directly tied plus everything else. So four hours maintenance windows to just be able to serve 100,000 uh, location and catch up with Kubernetes release schedule uh, will not cut it. It doesn't matter how many years I have. So we have to be more intelligent and that's where this smart maintenance operations comes in because if we can detect, for example, there's a lot of people this week here, so I will not touch anything. I see there's less uh, usage next week, so I can go and increase the coverage uh, the, by software on, on some antennas and remove ones of service, do the maintenance, and continue. So I don't need a human doing that process, okay? And, and that way we can be really uh, progressive on adopting all these new versions. So for that POC, I will let you know. Thank you. Time. All right, so we've been working for this proof of concept to demonstrate this goal-driven aware um, scheduling. We have three nodes of which uh, they have different power source. Of course, we're just simulating them, all right? Um, one for coal, petroleum, and natural gas. And as William was explaining, every single power source comes with a penalty, right? There are APIs that you can access to find out exactly when you have a, a server on a data center or even at home, but depending where the area where you are, you can find out if the electricity, the power that you receive, is powered by, by coal, petroleum, or natural gas. So the goal of a proof of concept is to demonstrate that we can move a workload uh, on the nodes, on the cluster, and keeping a certain amount of CO2 emissions. How do we achieve that? Well, this is the high-level solution architecture. There are quite a lot of components involved. This is the high level, and we're gonna uh, drill down on every single one. But at a higher level, we have uh, a governance that uses a policy engine. And the reason why there is this governance is because we want to enforce every workload that run on the cluster to use the, this optimization um, for the CO2 emissions. And that means as a cluster administrator, I can enforce everybody that deploy on my cluster 
all the energy efficiency policy that will be applied. Now, you have your manifest with the deployment pod or whatever. When it goes to the Cube API, then it gets to the scheduler. This scheduling part, that's where we have the intelligence and we will drill down on all, on all the specific components. But the magic happened thanks to another policy system. A policy that controls how the, schedule, the scheduler decide where the workload needs to, uh, to be scheduled, to be placed on the nodes. And next, a metric pipeline. As William was mentioning, we need to, to feed the system with metrics. Without the data, we don't have visibility of what's happening. So let's move to the next slide. All right, let's start with the metrics pipelines. There is quite a lot going on. So at node level, we're using the following components, okay? Kepler, that is a, a efficient power level exporter. It uses eBPF to get uh, power and uh, metrics consumption for individual pods that runs on the cluster. And all the metrics are exported for Prometheus. Then we have Telegraph. And the reason why we have Telegraph is because uh, if you're using the BMC, with ILO or IDRAC or whatever, there is an SMP interface and you can get a, a measurement about power usage on the host also from the BMC. In addition, you could have a collect D that collects other metrics as well. So all those metrics are exposed using exporter. And since we're talking about uh, Kubernetes right, right here, we have the Prometheus operator of which you can use the service monitor and all the service monitor does it creates a job on Prometheus that does the scraping of the metrics. And so we start filling up our Prometheus with all this data. Now, the next component is the analytics AI ML engine. So we take all those metrics, we combine them, we add the penalty that we discussed before, and we feed it to a model they use, uh, in this case, uh, XG Boost. It makes the machine learning model. It spit out uh, an output. That values for, our, for us are the new metrics that we call smart ops metrics. Then what's going to happen? We export also those other metrics for Prometheus. So we have another service monitor, and then the metrics goes back on Prometheus. So you see the flow. We start from the node, we collect metrics, goes on Prometheus, we pull it from Prometheus, we process it, we run it with a machine learning model, we we'll spit it out, we, we get it back on Prometheus. Once we're on Prometheus at this point, somehow we need to expose those metrics for consumption for the scheduler to do this intelligent scheduling that we're talking about. So in order to achieve that, we have a component called metrics proxy that all it is is just a simple Python flask that it does a, a query on the back end. It uses API service. If you never use the CR for API service, remember in Kubernetes, everything is an API. And uh, with API service, you can expose metrics. Okay? So this is the metric pipelines. All of this to just expose back to the scheduler something that is called a Kubernetes node metric. So why is a node metric? Because the scheduler makes decision where to schedule based on nodes. So it's filtered on, on nodes. So they need to be presented to the scheduler as a Kubernetes node metric. All right, now we get into the interesting part. The governance and scheduling that I was talking about before. So we drill down on our metrics pipeline right here. You can see in, uh, in yellow. Now let's see what's happening to details as far as the scheduling and the policy. So when you deploy a manifest on the cluster, there is Kivierno. If you don't know what it is, look at it. It's awesome. There was a talk also yesterday about it. Uh, using Kivierno, we have a lot of granularity of how you can manipulate in CR, do admission, generation, mutation, and so on. So we use Kivierno to pretty much Every pod deployment, stateful set that gets into the cluster, 
it gets injected um, the spec to use the custom scheduler. Okay? Now, let's get a little bit on the scheduling because, you know, we have our Kubernetes scheduler, right? But you can see right here we have something called secondary scheduler. The reason is we did this proof of concept on OpenShift, and let's say that you don't have much flexibility if you want to make changes to the scheduler on OpenShift. You're not going to be able to do it. We provide some profiles, but you cannot make changes at, at the cube scheduler configuration. So we have a component that is no operator that is called a secondary scheduler operator that all it does, it's running another Kubernetes scheduler. Just the standard Kubernetes scheduler. The one that has the intelligence and actually does all the decision and the, the policy processing is a component called Intel TAS. Intel TAS, it's a telemetry aware scheduler so it uses a, a policy-driven decision for scheduling and, um, uh, and the scheduling on nodes. So let's look at this flow. We deploy the manifest. It goes to the secondary scheduler because we injected the information to use this additional scheduler. And uh, uh, Intel TAS is implemented as uh, an extender, right? So when, you get the, when the scheduler gets the message, you can see that there is the extender configured on the cube scheduler configuration, so it triggers a request, a filter request to the TAS. So the TAS, it's always reconciling policy. Those policy are based on strategies. And you can define several strategies. For example, a schedule strategies that says, okay, if the CO2 emission, it's... Um, uh, it's less than 100 units, schedule, allowed to schedule on the node. Otherwise, if it's greater than 100, the schedule, okay? We'll cover the, the schedule part because the, the scheduler, of course, it's not capable of the scheduling. There is another component here that is called the, the scheduler. And the way it works very quickly, pretty much, when the policy is in violation, right? He, he had a, a label to the node that he gets an, an affinity. So that the scheduler see if there is any affinity on, on, on the node. And what he does is evicts the pod that is going to get rescheduled, right? And the other one is don't schedule. So don't schedule if uh, the CO2 emission is greater than 100 units, okay? So as you can see, you have a lot of flexibility and control of what you can do with this. And look, here we're talking about CO2 emission, all right? By using this architecture, think about, um, I don't know, any kind of metrics. It doesn't need to be the CO2. It could be, you know, CPU, memory. It could be uh, query an API for, for the weather in that area. I don't know. You have a multi-cluster and you want to distribute the workloads based on the weather, you know, it's in, in some area, the temperature is higher, that means the power implant are, you know, working harder to provide electricity, or even if it's too colder, actually. And so you want to do this kind of things. But not only that, since now the scheduler on Kubernetes get the intelligence to make decisions based on metrics, this open a world of opportunities. Your application, your workload, or web application, or whatever you're running on the cluster, could become aware of, you know, condition externally to the cluster. So you could get an holistic view of the network and your application knows what's happening around and in the network. And you can make scheduled decisions based on that. So if you ask me, well, as a telco guy, I see this extremely powerful because in telco we talk a lot about uh, network slicing, so guarantee the SLAs or some throughput or bandwidth and all of that. Right now, you cannot do it in Kubernetes. How do you guarantee the SLA? Yes, okay, on the pod, request, limit, whatever, you can do some QoS, but once we get into the networking stuff or you know, other things, you don't have that capabilities. So by using this stack, it opens a, a world of opportunity of things that you can do. 
Now, let's see if we have uh, a little bit more about the policy right here. Uh, there is another strategy for the policy that is called labeling. So if something is in violation, you can uh, configure some custom labeling for the node, and then you can decide uh, what to do for the affinity for different rules. So let's go again from the flow, all right? Manifest, you deploy. Uh, it uses the secondary scheduler. Secondary scheduler send the filter request to the task. The task is already reconciling this policy. They use specific metrics. And by the, here, by the way, here you see just a simple if metric, greater, or, or less than. You have much more flexibility. You can do if, and, or. You can do combinations. So it doesn't have to be only one metric. You, you can combine the metrics, right? And then, using this information of the metric, the task sent, sent the API request to the custom metrics API that we expose with that service called the metrics proxy, and it gets the information. And at this point, we know that the node, for example, uh, node four, has a 37.75 unit, so it's not violating the policy. And we will tell the scheduler that, yes, you're good, you can, you can deploy that workload on node four. Simple, right? Now, we created a little dashboard just to demonstrate this. So we have uh, the three nodes, the different power source, and, and then we have a meter bar for the CO2 emissions. And what you see below, below here, it's a node two, three, four. And those boxes is for the pod placement. So when there is a green box, that means a pod has been placed there. So we, gen we generate a bunch of loads to you know, simulate more usage and more energy usage. And what's gonna happen, that our goal is to make sure that it stays below 220 units per node, right? So as you can see on the top screenshot, the node uh, W3 in this case, node three, is in violation. So it has no workload, nothing that runs on that. But as soon as the node one, where we have our work workload running, it gets some violation of the policy, so the CO2 emission uh, go over the value that we define, at the point it gets rescheduled on, uh, in this case, on, on node four, that is not in violation of the policy. So this is for CO2, but again, the solution architecture that you saw and the, comp the components put it all together, it, it opens a lot of possibility of the things that you can do. And this is thanks a lot to the Intel TAS that makes the scheduler intelligent and metrics aware on, um, on scheduling and the scheduling decision. So this is it. Uh, thank you, everyone. Let's go and take some I'll do yeah. some finish. So s some of the projects that were used here, so Kepler, so that's the, the URL, uh, is, as Francisco was mentioning, is, is a, it's a really cool project that allow us to measure or on per pot uh, energy on, on millijoules. Uh, there's a PLC that we also did uh, with Keta, uh, with the Keta team, uh, upstream, in Microsoft and the Red City of Office, uh, and that use uh, CO2 to do uh, scaling, per se. So it's, it's a CO2-aware scaling. Uh, Intel TAS, uh, that's the link. The Data Science Hub there uh, is based on Open Data Hub. So as you can see, all, all of these are elements that already exist, so we just are using them uh, in an integrated fashion. And as the next evolution of this, this project that precisely was announced by Intel uh, last week, and, and they have been showing this week, basically that's part of what we intend to, to work uh, on, on a future iteration of this. So that's it. So any question and you want uh, to provide feedback? Thank you, everyone.
Questions? Yes, please, go ahead. Oh, he's coming. Thank you. It's a very nice talk. I just have a question about like uh, the policies. If you set it to like these schedules, so you do some evictions of the pot, right? For the know that while later. Mm -hmm. So do you have consider like priorities to deschedule the pot, or you treat every pot the same? Which pot are you going to deschedule? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So right now, this we, we are treating every single pot the same. So what we did is. All the, all the workload where we were testing this, because this is actually a multi-tenant uh, cluster. So we were only doing the calculation based on a single namespace and the pods there. So we did not account for the total across the whole node. Otherwise, we'll have to descale far more than our pods in, in that cluster. And the task policy are namespace scope. So we will need a Kivierno policy, but every time uh, maybe a developer creates a project on that cluster, it, it inject the task policy on that namespace. And then at that point, it's going to apply the scheduling and the scheduling decision based on that policy. OK, thank you. Does it answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I can tell you, for example, I know that AWS does have uh, a tool for that. I know that GCP is also providing something, and, and Azure. Outside those three, I don't know. And the level of granularity on each one is very dependent on, on the cloud provider. There are some that is really about what happened three months ago, not what's happening now. And there are others that are uh, far more accurate. Actually, that lady over there, Nikki, she's far more familiar with, <laughs> with the APIs for this on, on the cloud service provider. Okay. We've got okay. two minutes left. Any other questions? And if anyone really is interested on anything related to green computing, uh, I don't know if you're aware that CNCF just created and approved uh, the environmental sustainability tag. And we will have several working groups there, okay? Hopefully, one of the working groups will be on the technical side. Some of them will be on how do we fix the APIs <laughs> once and for all. <laughs> uh, so we, because we, we need accurate data, and that is really, really hard. And the places where it is available is usually behind a paywall. So we need a, a better way to do this, yeah. So that's it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.